and welcome once again to Father Spitzer's Universe at the intersection of faith and reason. And I'm Doug Tech, the gatekeeper here on Mother Angelica Way, the mothership where it all started back in 1981 and keeps on sailing thanks to you. Email your questions to us at spitzersuniverse at ewtn.com. It's central to the program. And check out all the Father Spitzer's websites, imagicenter.com and purposefuluniverse.com and also spitzercenter.org, all a little different all insightful. Father Spitzer Universe is always available on our EW10 YouTube channel and the EW10 On Demand page. And while you are visiting our On Demand page, which is on our website, check out the Miracle Box. Learn about the healing power of God bestowed through the Sacrament of Confession, something Father talks about all the time on this program. See it now and for free, and it's on demand anytime. Check that out. And of course, we are continuing our topic this week with the moral wisdom of the Catholic Church, available through our religious catalog, as always, along with some of the other great books that Father now has out. And the <coughs> book of the month for November, Rejoicing in Our Hope, by our good friend Bishop Robert J. Baker, uh, based on some programming he did for us for many years on Advent and on Christmas. And it carries you right through Advent through the Christmas season. And with that, we turn to our Mr. Universe himself on the West Coast, that's Father Robert Spitzer. Great to see you. <laughs> Great to be with you, Doug. And I'll uh, just start us with a prayer. Absolutely. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for your many blessings to us, the blessing especially of this ministry and our ability to serve in it. We ask you to send your Holy Spirit down upon us now, Doug, myself, our whole staff and audience, so that everything we do and say and hear will be brought to fruition in your will for the good of your people, your church, and your kingdom. We ask all of these things through Jesus our Lord. Amen. Amen. And Mary, seat of wisdom, pray Amen. for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Always great to start things off that way here with you, Father. I hope you've had a good week. Oh, I did. <laughs> okay, Keep, keeping yourself and Joan busy, I'm assuming, right? Yeah, exactly. The I, Joan, is busier than ever. <laughs> right. So you, you've got a couple of books we did that, that, that are out. Sure. Uh, why don't you mention those two uh, newer books that are out? Sure. Uh, the first one is a Science at the Doorstep to God, mm -hmm. um, Science and Reason in Support of God, Jesus, and Life After Death. And this uh, book is put out by Ignatius Press and answers, it looks at all of the newest evidence for God, Jesus, and the soul mm -hmm. uh, from contemporary science and also from philosophy. Okay. Also, we have, um, that came out, a book that really is trying to answer the major questions uh, about the Bible and uh, looking at that from the vantage point of science and historicity. That book is from OSV Press and it's called Science, Reason, and Faith right. Discovering the Bible. Science, right. Reason, and Faith Discovering the Bible. And both of those available obviously through our catalog <coughs> and also we're looking to sometime <coughs> next year uh, to be able to put out a book under EWTM Publishing, publishing some of the highlights <coughs> of the wise sayings of Father Spitzer uh, from this particular program <laughs> culled from the many hours uh, of our recording. So we will look forward to that as well. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> there you go. Okay. Did I, I say that the way you the wanted me to say that? <laughs> but they are sayings. <laughs> That's right. So anyway, so here's a couple of stories in the news before we get into uh, some questions and topics. Sure. thought this was interesting that a new uh, report uh, came out last week from a Christian advocacy group says that Christian Christianity continues to thrive and grow despite brutal repression and attempts by governments and groups and individuals across the world to squash the faith, quash the faith. Uh, from a 223 Persecutors of the Year report was released this month by a group called Christian Concern, ICC. Uh, Shed's report on the suffering of hundreds of millions of Christians uh, in 10 of the most heavily persecuted countries, and it makes the point of the amount of persecution that's going on, which I think you probably could say the Christians are the most persecuted people, <laughs> religious in the world at this point in time. And, uh, but at the same time, though the persecution is there, it's still growing. That tells us something about how Christianity and then ultimately Catholicism work, right? 
Oh, yeah. I always said that um, one of the great proofs of the Holy Spirit's working in history is the fact that every time a, a government or an empire tries to persecute the church and persecute Christianity, it grows much more aggressively and uh, even exponentially. And we certainly saw that in the Roman Empire. Mm -hmm. uh, throughout 200 years of persecution, the church grew so rapidly and so much that by, of course, the, the Edict of Milan with Constantine, uh, by that time the church became um, the official church of the Roman Empire and of course the number of converts was exponentially through the ceiling mm -hmm. uh, and the whole time it, it existed practically uh, was being persecuted and we're just seeing the same thing today the more that governments try to persecute the church the more they try to extinguish it it seems that you know people everywhere just begin to to rise up and they begin to 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 aggressively not only defend their faith start new New programs, evangelize, and of course, God mm -hmm. just keeps adding a great deal of fuel to that fire. I mean, look at all the evidence uh, we're just talking about from science mm -hmm. that has uh, come, uh, you know, just in just the last 20 years for um, the evidence for God from contemporary cosmology, from near-death experiences and terminal lucidity, the evidence for a soul in the afterlife, mm -hmm. the evidence for Jesus, I mean, the Shroud of Turin, the Eucharistic miracles. You start looking at all this stuff, you go, holy mackerel. I mean, God's just, you know, pouring it on just as, you know, kids are getting more skeptical about their faith saying, you know, science and, and faith are contradictory. God just pours all this new evidence into the mix. So it's almost irresistible and great now scientific institutes, New York Academy of Sciences, et cetera, et cetera, are now talking freely about this thing. And now we see that young mm -hmm. scientists are now 66% believers in God and a higher transcendent power. Only uh, about 15% are not. Mm -hmm. And doctors, 76% of doctors are believers in God, two thirds of whom practice their faith. And uh, only about 11.5% uh, or 11.6% are atheists. So wow. you look at that and you go, wow, what's going on? God's pouring in the grace. And he's pouring in the grace with all these innovative programs programs that people are doing. Mm -hmm. And even though right now, uh, you know, uh, in some campaigns we're getting our, our chops busted a little bit, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in the pro-life um, area for the political movements, mm -hmm. you watch just these kinds of actions are going to provoke people to do the opposite. Mm -hmm. And I'm hoping that through this program and other programs and all of the things that we're doing in so many innovative pro-life organizations, educational institutions, and, you know, advocacy organizations, et cetera, mm -hmm. all of them, we're going to change this around. By the time we're done in 10 years, we're not just going to have 50% of the states uh, that have uh, got abortion ban bans going on there. Mark my words, uh, this is going to be far more than 50%. I'd say mm -hmm. 65, 70% of states, if we can work tirelessly for this and turn, uh, you know, all of this kind of cheap, you know, m you know, m misadvertising to our advantage right. and expose the kinds of uh, fictions that the, the poor abortion movement is, is publishing mm -hmm. with reckless abandon. I think it's going to happen. Look at what's going on with transgenderism. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, even though the United States, of course, is holding out, you know, right, quote unquote, right. valiantly right, right. to the end, uh, every other like Norway, uh, Finland, Sweden, Great Britain, they're all abandoning ship, turning back on the whole uh, gender affirming therapy movement and of course mm -hmm. the sexual reassignment uh, surgery movement is a really almost a thing of the past government funding can't even be used for it so you know it's very interesting to right. see you watch and I think backlash 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 and backlash this is going right. to go back right to the same scenario we saw in the Roman Empire and so I think that's a right. very insightful little article right. uh, there about Christianity flourishing I think that's really what's going to happen and I also think uh, with immigration and all kinds of other things, I think it's just going to keep on going. I mean, yes, there are, you know, political uh, parties and their political uh, candidates that, you know, are going to uh, keep it up or governmental agencies and, and uh, you know, that are going to mm -hmm. keep up, you know, pressure and things of that nature. But at the same time, I think we are, we shall right. overcome. Right. And uh, we have overcome in the past and we'll continue to right. do it because faith is alive and well and the Holy Spirit is right. stoking it and there's lots of people who really put their faith in it. Right, and, and talking about oppression, I just had a, a, an opportunity to talk to a father 
uh, Don Bosco, who works for us uh, for Aussie Africa, doing a, a newswire out of Africa in English, oh, yeah. French, and, and, and soon to be, I believe, in Portuguese. Um, and, you know, uh -huh. obviously the pressure and, and, and the, the persecution that's happening there, but meanwhile the church is flourishing. Oh, yeah. No, I mean, it's one of the fastest growing areas for Christianity in the world, uh, Africa. But, I mean, of course, if you start looking at uh, other international countries, certainly in India and mm -hmm. Asia, uh, you know, it's, it's flourishing as well. So um, uh, just stay mm -hmm. tuned. I mean, yes, I know that, uh, uh, you know, Europe is, <laughs> you know, has certainly slowed down to almost a mud slog. Right. And the United States is trying uh, to imitate it, but you know we have uh, immigration policies here that that really do mm -hmm. allow for the growth of uh, of religion uh, still, and uh, a really uh, a heart you know the people's heart is is really in it. So right. I, I'm I, I'm a believer, and of course you know as I've always maintained, I'm an optimist. Others are pessimists, um, but uh, I'm I'm not going to. I'll be not only happier than them, but right. I'll be right more often. That's that's okay. <laughs> you can be the optimist, and I'll be the pessimist. <laughs> Uh, so that's why <laughs> okay. that's why it fits so well. Uh, well, we have the uh, France yeah, is the right. <laughs> known as the elder daughter of the church. I think she she might be on a respirator, unfortunately, right now. Unless we uh, uh, we yeah. hope uh, mercy killing yeah. doesn't come for her or the other uh, yeah. great former members of Christendom, uh, which are, oh, yeah. are struggling to surely uh, hold on to the faith. Surely. I was going back and forth. You kept going yep. between near-death experiences in your last answer and abortion, and I have to article on each one. I was trying to figure which one I was going to follow up oh. on, but I'm going to follow up on abortion. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I kept changing my sheet here. Okay. Uh, there was a story oh, recently that came good. out, but it, uh, it was reported now in the mainstream press more that, that the well-known pop star Britney Spears uh, you know, had a tragic revelation that she felt pushed in unwanted abor abortion and has been haunted by it ever since. And even this article, a secular mm -hmm. writer said, if Britney Spears at the time still has to this day one of the most famous women in the world can feel pressured into an abortion, apparently by her father's insistence, according to Reuters, what about an ordinary, mm -hmm. any ordinary woman? How would they feel? And they say Spears' story aligns with recent polling that found that nearly 70 percent of women who have had abortions didn't want to, and many of them felt coerced. And uh, Dr. Grassi uh, Christie, who uh, does a radio show on our network and has done some spots called In a Pro-Life mm -hmm. Minute, she's fabulous, uh, in a piece in the Examiner mm -hmm. said, abortion advocates are pro-choice only if that choice is abortion. And they talk about the idea, and you were mentioning it earlier, that they're, that they're so busy pushing abortion on women, they're even taking out roadside billboards in a grotesque campaign that says, God's plan includes abortion. I don't know who the person came up with that, but I, I wouldn't want to be them when they meet our Lord, that's for sure. Oh, no. No, I, I wouldn't either, because, boy, is that the lie of the century. Mm -hmm. And, of course, we know that every life is precious and was meant for eternity, was meant to be loved, and was meant to be raised in, in a family um, that, uh, that truly uh, uh, sees the glory of God uh, in their midst. And so my thought is, boy, that is the lie of the century, and you know what spirit is responsible for that. Mm -hmm. But uh, also I would um, hasten to add that, yes, Yes, the uh, pressure um, that people are put under, especially women are put under, it's the same pressure we see with euthanasia. Everybody says, well, why, why does the church want to get involved in this movement? If somebody wants to commit suicide, that's their business. Mm -hmm. But every time you open the door to, you know, physician-assisted suicide, that means that, uh, you know, a thousand people, uh, you know, uh, that don't want assisted suicide right. are going to have pressures that they never had before from doctors, from family members, from governments, from insurance companies, and you look at the same thing has happened to women. Mm -hmm. Why not give women the option? Because if you give women the option, you open the door to pressurizing all those women who don't want an abortion. Now the door is open for relatives, well-meaning or otherwise. Right. Open the door for, for relatives, for government officials, and not just them to pressure people, but for the marketing campaigns mm -hmm to begin to make it look as if God, for example, could possibly be for killing the innocent. Give me a break. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, uh, again, the, the, the lies are just getting so much 
you know, but by the fact that the lies are becoming so outrageous, you can see the desperation that our opposition feels right now, because there is a surge toward life. There is a desire uh, to start respecting life. And I'm glad Britney Spears came out and actually said this and talked mm -hmm. about the pressure that she felt. And as uh, you know, that the, the most comprehensive study uh, that has been done on um, the, the medical repercussions mm -hmm. of, uh, of abortion uh, show that 82 percent of um, women, this is by the way published in the British Journal of Psychiatry as mm -hmm. well as um, uh, the Cambridge University website, but if you can see that 82 percent actually after an abortion they have much greater levels of suicidal contemplation and suicides and um, a depression, anxiety, substance abuse, et cetera. And if I remember the study's findings, I think it was a, um, a four times increase in suicidal um, uh, contemplation, a 2.5 times increase in suicides, and I forget, uh, I think a 1.5 times increase in, in uh, um, alcoholism. Maybe I'm understating those statistics right. slightly, but I mean, it's right in that range. And I can tell you now, uh, this is not a healthy choice for women. And part of the reason is the pressure that right. these poor women uh, underwent uh, prior to the right. abortion. It wasn't their choice. It was really the choice of others around them. Right. Or, or uh, unfortunately, their, their personal financial or whatever circumstances where they felt the same way that there was mm -hmm. that kind of pressure. Um, mm -hmm. Going on the near-death experience, uh, an article that uh, came from Fox mm -hmm. News, cardiologist reflects on near-death research featured in new film uh, separating reality from fantasy. A cardiologist who spent years uh, conducting comprehensive medical investigations into near-death experiences confessed he didn't always believe that they were real. I thought the whole thing was a hoax. I really did. Michael Dr. Michael Sabom, I hope I pronounced his name right, explained yeah. to Fox Digital. Mm -hmm. You're familiar with him then, right? Okay. He started oh, yeah. a, a five-year yeah. study, and this might be what you were referring to earlier, at the University of Florida, interviewing 100 people who had been resuscitated about their experiences for his book, Reflect Recollections on Death, which was published way back, I guess, in 82. Mm -hmm. And he says, I had originally... That's right, way uh, old. Mm -hmm. Way old. I had originally thought that these experiences were hallucinations or delusions or made-up fabrications. But these people were telling the details mm -hmm. about what was going on, what was going on in this room, as you've talked about before, uh, mm -hmm. during the resuscitation, when I knew that they were physically unconscious and near death during a cardiac arrest. He goes on to say that uh, he recalled how these patients would recall visions they saw of very sophisticated instruments or procedures that were being done in the room at the time. He did a control group study afterward interviewing cardiac patients from similar backgrounds who had not experienced near-death experience to test their knowledge of the resuscitation procedures. He found the majority of the control group made major errors in their descriptions compared to the patients who mm -hmm. had near-death experiences. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Uh, this is, uh, you know, Sabom's book was pretty, right. uh, you know, like I said, 82. It's way right. back there. But, uh, uh, I mean, yeah, he did uh, very much turn, uh, turn around on this issue and very much uh, became uh, an advocate for the reality uh, of uh, near-death experiences because, obviously, there was consciousness, um, you know, going on uh, that was able to, to make reports of very technical procedures, which uh, patients, you know, lay patients would ordinarily not have known. But the most interesting thing that it not only turned him around, but of course turned many other people around, uh, was that um, there are so many accurate reports of what was going on outside the operating room. So, right. you know, like when Bradley Burroughs, the, the boy that was blind from birth, um, you know, a 16-year-old kid, had no agenda, uh, basically said, oh, I went right outside the hospital walls and mm -hmm. I saw this train, you know, passing by, uh, you know, which had a big, huge sign on the back of the train with a arrow pointing to the right, and at the very time I was unconscious, uh, there came the train and it went right down the train tracks into mm -hmm. this grove of trees which is positioned over here. I've never seen any colors in my life. Uh, now I know what white looks like and green oh, wow. looks like. I mm -hmm. saw that train going into the into the trees, and I'm telling you that's what happened, and that's exactly what happened. And, of course, I've told a million other stories like right, this. Absolutely. I mean, he was a blind kid, right. but, you, you know, people who are just on top of the roof, outside the hospital walls, right. et cetera, et cetera, that's been a huge area. And the second big uh, area that has really, you know, 
brought so many of the physicians over uh, is the, the fact that about 80% of blind people, most of whom were blind from birth, not only see accurately for the first time, like that kid Brad, Bradley right. Burroughs, but other, you know, many other people see for the first time and accurately report what's going on, not just in the operating room, but what's going on outside the hospital, right. on top of the hospital, in the waiting room next door, et cetera. Right. So these are the things, you know, you take a guy like Sabom, and initially they think, oh, it must be anoxia. Maybe it's, uh, you know, some uh, stimulation of, of the parietal lobe. Maybe it's dreamless, you know, maybe it's this, maybe it's that, and then all of a sudden they go, but how in the world could they possibly report, right. you know, data that they had, you know, absolutely no idea about outside the hospital and in the waiting room? And furthermore, how blind people could do this, again and again, 80% of the cases, mm -hmm. it became overwhelming that, um, you know, this, this really, I think that's why the New York Academy of Sciences last year actually right. published uh, uh, the report in their own proceedings that there's a very credible possibility your consciousness is going to survive bodily death. I mean, right. one other thing that, that's kind of uh, interesting to see with the, the near-death ex experiences, physicalist explanations just can't possibly explain it because, after all, uh, you know, hallucinations generally are highly inaccurate, mm -hmm. whereas near-death experiences as, as Sabom was just saying, that right. those are actually highly accurate and oftentimes 100% accurate. And then the, the second thing is, is um, you know, near death, I mean, um, electrical activity in the brain. If right. you're going to hallucinate something or if you're going to have your parietal lobe stimulated, if you're going to have dr dreamless, you're going to have to have electrical activity in the brain. Whereas in near death experiences, it's precisely the opposite. You have a flat EEG. There's no electrical activity in the cerebral and frontal cortices, and furthermore, right. no, and not in the auditory lobes, visual lobes, etc. Only a few sputterings of neurons in the in the lower brain. So at that point, of course, a totally different experience: electrical activity, no electrical activity in the brain. And finally, of course, hallucinations are very agitating and anxiety-producing, right. whereas uh, near-death experiences are very peaceful, harmonious, and give a sense of hope. Okay. So a totally different, the physicalist explanations don't measure up. Okay. And I think that's what's brought the majority of uh, research doctors okay. around. Great. Very good. Uh, another quick article. Uh, mm -hmm. I thought this was interesting. Uh, Denver Archbishop uh, comes out with an article about uh, marijuana destroys souls, okay? Denver Archbishop Shamu mm -hmm, J. Mm -hmm. Aquila released a pastoral letter this week citing church doctrine to caution against the broad acceptance of recreational marijuana. I write you out of pastoral concern for the salvation of souls. I'm convinced uh, of the need to address the, the impact marijuana use is having on individuals, family, society in general, Aquila wrote in an introduction to a 60-page letter. Uh, in 2012, out, uh, Colorado became the first state to legalize recreational marijuana. 23 other states hence have followed, Ohio becoming the most recent. He said, in Colorado, we are now a decade into this experiment. As more studies come out and more deaths from fentanyl pi pile up, we now have an overwhelming amount of data that reinforces that we have known to be true all along. Legalization of marijuana and cultural acceptance of drug have been disastrous to our society. Your thoughts? Well, you know, I don't have the scientific data, and obviously Archbishop Aquila does. Right. So, I mean, I, I believe it, and I'm not surprised at all, you know, uh, being a person who was in high school in the late 1960s, <laughs> I can assure you, uh, we had our fair share of heads out there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the guys who were like who were smoking the, uh, the weed on a, on, a, on a regular basis, you could just tell their mental activity, their mm -hmm. creativity, and boy, the level of distraction mm -hmm. of these persons and of course they, we call them heads because they basically mm -hmm. they get, we're getting lazier and lazier you know uh, and I'll lay around and just because I'll have another uh, toke there you know and right. uh, and uh, basically you look at this thing and you go oh wow you know this doesn't look uh, altogether very good but then you could really see that their uh, their mental activity their energy mm -hmm. levels their uh, and and their creativity just <laughs> started sapping away and they believed their own kind of hallucination nations, you know, that, oh, I can do anything I want, really. Uh, I suppose I could fly, you know, if I really <laughs> wanted to, you know, and of course, these, you'd look at these guys like, uh-huh, 
Uh, I believe you. Right. And of course, the, the idea is that uh, uh, do these people really believe? Well, maybe they don't, but are they much more prone to believe in the fantasy right. worlds that they invent? Oh, yeah. Right. Are they much more um, you know, prone to be sitting on their uh, rear ends you know, and doing nothing? Yes. Are they much more prone uh, to lose that, that sense of creativity and energy and dynamic you know, desire right. for productivity? Absolutely. I mean, you know, if I've seen it once, I've seen it a hundred times. I mean, uh, not that I hung around with a whole bunch of them, mm. but I mean, let's face facts. Everybody knew, you know, who the heads were right. at school, and so and you now know, you basically that well, right. And and mm. there's a difference between the uh, if, if there's a appropriate use for medical marijuana, if that's found to be something that can can be prescribed for somebody versus the recreational use, which yeah. means oh, it's just it's okay. Yeah. The other thing I would think you're also marrying, uh, you know, this kind of virtual reality isolation world with people with headsets and a computer, with these kind of isolating yeah. drugs and compounding this virtual mm -hmm. universe people are living in. Oh yeah, no, I think that's very, very true as well. I mean, uh, back in in my high school days, of course, we didn't have that kind of virtual world mm -hmm. uh, to to marry into, as it were. Mm -hmm. But uh, today you do, and I right. think it, uh, you know. So I mean, you just see, you know, dozens and dozens of perfectly healthy uh, people sitting in their mother's basements over there right. Right. playing their video games, and honestly, just you know, like productivity levels have mm -hmm. gone down to zero, and you know, the whole idea of doing something with their lives. I mean, they becoming you know classic ne'er-do-wells mm -hmm. and, and you look at that and you go okay, I don't think this is that great for people and then of course there's the you know in half that population you know what's gonna happen they're gonna want to get a bigger charge so it's not just gonna be marijuana anymore I think I need the elephant weed I need the ganja then the next thing is oh, you know I think I like a little mescaline here a little mm -hmm. hit that kind of helps things uh, go for you know now that I think about it a little cocaine wouldn't be too no. bad and well fentanyl no, wow, what a high that is. Mm -hmm. You know, and of course you, you start, you know, going right down the old right. train. That doesn't happen with everybody, but right. it sure does happen with a lot right. of people. They want the bigger and bigger deal. It's the same thing with pornography. You start in on it and half that population starts going to the harder and harder kinds right. of pornography. Absolutely. And the reason to is they the want the bigger charge. They need well they even mm -hmm. to maintain that charge that they had before, they yeah. need to increase the dosage because the body gets Precisely. used to it. Right. right, exactly. Right. Here's a question uh, we'll Precisely. get to here from, from one of our audience before sure. we go to the break. Dear Father Spitzer, wonderful show and I watch you weekly. You frequently discuss the narcissism in today's culture and I see it all over the place, but I also see a lot of paranoia, lonely, scared people who are too afraid of others to trust anyone. I read that narcissism and paranoia are almost the same thing. The difference is that the narcissists have an inflated self-worth and paranoids have a low self-worth. How can we Catholics help paranoid people since they disrupt others so much? Christopher. Well, Christopher, is a really good question. There is a relation, but you're absolutely right. They have opposite uh, manifestations. Mm -hmm. Uh, I mean, a paranoid uh, person clearly uh, feels uh, fear, and that's one side of the scale. The other side of the scale is hubris. Uh, the narcissist generally tends toward hubris, uh, not toward uh, paranoia uh, most of the time. However, that changes radically when the narcissist gets to a certain level of power uh, or a certain level of pride. Uh, you know, they start getting the old Hitler complex, mm -hmm. um, and maybe with due warrant. But the the, the fact is, of course, is, you know, people are out to get me, and of course, I've got enough power, and i got to protect my power, and then you begin to see that they spend much, much, much more time uh, protecting themselves uh, from their enemies. And then they kind of do a Howard Hughes switch. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Howard Hughes starts off kind of very narcissistic, right? I mean, the guy was really a brilliant man. I mean, Absolutely. Uh, I mean, the, the accomplishments of the man are uh, unbelievable. But nevertheless, he starts off, but then, <clears throat> you know, he gets uh, uh, from a really inflated self-image, he begins to think, you know, people are trying to take this away from me and so forth and so on. So, I mean, right. he's, he starts in, you know, taking all these evasive actions, and then, you know, oddly enough, he, he does this kind of strange switch. <clears throat> he goes into ne'er-do-well mode, right? He's just uh, taking heroin, 
letting his hair grow down right. to his uh, shoulders, uh, just kind of watching Ice Station Zebra again and again and again and again. But he's like taking all these actions, you know, uh, almost paranoid actions, mm -hmm. you know, to, uh, to protect himself. And you look at that and you go, I'm not surprised. So oftentimes the narcissist can move right. uh, to a state of paranoia when they think that now people are trying to get what I've got or they're trying to right. move in in my position and my glory but it, it comes from the same root you know I'm, right. I'm you know I'm, I'm kind of the the center of the universe and uh, not that uh, some people do think they're God, uh, right. but some people actually think that they're uh, the center of the universe. They, they have that uh, sort of Hitlerian messianism, and they begin to think, well, you know, uh, let, they let their hubris go. Right. And when they do, uh, very ordinarily, um, it, you, know, you, you know, you can uh, actually right. see them progress uh, to the side of paranoia. Right. So Absolutely. hubris and fear are kind of on a scale. And, so, and, uh, so instead uh, they kind of end up in yeah. a virtual ice station zebra for, of their own there and, yeah. and stuck in a, in a thing that keeps cycling around and around. Speaking of that, we got to take a break, yeah. so we're going to oh. leave it there, oh, okay. come back uh, after the break, okay. much more ahead and as Walter Spitzer gives even more information to us. Uh, there's a plethora coming and more different topics ahead. Stay with us. <laughs> still here and so are you it's great to see you uh, as we continue with the topic of father's book on the moral wisdom of the catholic church but first which is of course available through our catalog also want to mention a great book is very very popular new friends now and forever a story about the holy souls by susan Dasoni, the purgatory lady we gotta mention that one uh, it's still november so we have to think of the holy souls through our ewtn religious catalog a great christmas gift uh, to give to your grandkids and or your kids that would be terrific. And speaking of that, uh, I, I'm a little paranoid that you didn't quite answer that question and that we're going to get lots of letters from people saying, why did Doug Keck interrupt Father for the hundredth time? So with that, I'm going to cede you more time, uh, Father Spitzer, to finish your answer. Go ahead. Oh, and just Christopher's uh, question was, how do you help people like that? Right. I mean, the most direct way of helping a person who really is narcissistic is to reintroduce them to God and specifically to Jesus Christ. And I think this, you know, if you start look, getting into the sacraments, the sacrament especially of reconciliation, but getting into uh, the scriptures about what Jesus says about humility and start reading some of the saints. I think St. Teresa of Avila is still the reason and she's a doctor of the church is because she's the anti-hubris, mm -hmm. anti-pride, uh, pride, um, you know, uh, a sister of the century. I mean, the, mm -hmm. the saint of the century. I mean, there, you know, Augustine, of course, waxes eloquently against pride because it almost destroyed him. So the Confessions is a really good book on that level. And by the way, Augustine had a super high IQ. If mm -hmm. anyone deserved to be, you know, filled with pride and hubris, it, it was Augustine. But the, the, the Saint Augustine. But the point is, oh, Saint Teresa of Avila. I would just read that book, The Way of Perfection. Mm -hmm. Now I know it's addressed to her sisters. Don't worry about that just just look at it and just say what's in it for me mm -hmm. and you start listening to her and her relationship with God and the beauty of how she just loves Christ loves uh, Christ on the cross you know her explication of the our father and so forth and so on and what is coming out again and again and again and again she's giving us little methods to overcome our pride overcome hubris mm -hmm. I mean for me she's like the breath of fresh air that gets my Spitzerian narcissism under control uh, before it becomes Becomes paranoid, and so uh, in any case, I right. recommend those great saints, Augustine and and uh, Saint Teresa of Avila. I certainly recommend the Scriptures. I certainly recommend uh, many of the other people who 
who've written whole tractates uh, you know, on, mm -hmm. on humility. And I think the, the one of the very, very best imitation of Christ by St. Thomas of Kempis. Right. I could w go on on this, but uh, if you're going to get an, an audio version of that, get that Lagos Educational Edition uh, with a translation by Dr. Bill Creasy. I mean, th I'm telling you, that's a good volume. It's an accessible volume. And in a, a modern, you know, day uh, language, uh, that's the one to read. But those three classics, I would say, okay. if that if you take them seriously and you take God seriously, you take your eternal life seriously and you start taking love seriously, humility will matter. Mm -hmm. And if humility matters and compassion matters, then I'm telling you, uh, you will be rescued from narcissism. But, but if you don't, narcissism will move into its usual, you know, uh, mm -hmm. paranoid function. And uh, so you're quite right, Christopher. Uh, that's the answer to your question. Okay, another question. Dear Father Spitzer, like everyone, I have crosses in my life. As I've grown closer to God, I've received many more. I am getting overwhelmed with so much pain and sadness in my life. I receive the sacraments frequently, and yet I experience no joy. I frequently fall into bouts of long and severe depression. What am I doing wrong, Anne? And I don't think you're, you're doing necessarily anything wrong. Mm -hmm. um, perhaps you, you know, there might be something there, but I, mm -hmm. I, you know, I don't know you well enough, so I don't think you're probably doing anything wrong. I've got this little, what I call, um, a desolation checklist. Mm -hmm. And I, I think there are a variety of, of ways of looking at it, but I, I could just, uh, if you just send me a note, spitzer at mongecenter.com, I can send you my little desolation checklist. You can take a look at it. But you may be just going through a time in your life uh, of what might be termed final purgation. Mm -hmm. And, and um, uh, you know, like you probably read about Mother Teresa, or now Saint Mother Teresa, um, and uh, of, of uh, you know, Teresa of Calcutta. Mm -hmm. And if you look at that uh, for just a second, you'll see that she experienced like uh, 25 years of real dark, you know, just darkness, kind of a desolation, mm -hmm. kind of, as you put it, sort of bouts of depression, but it's not, you know, clinical depression. It was kind of like a spiritual darkness and loneliness uh, that she experienced. You say, well, what did she do wrong? I mean, right. she's doing everything right. You know, what was going on? And there is, a, you know, a, a, a thing we call the dark night of the soul or the dark night of the spirit. And that actually does happen. It's a kind of a final purgative moment where God just sort of detaches us from all the things in the world, even from the, the joys of the world. Mm. And, and basically, when we do that, uh, it opens upon, as it did for Mother Teresa, right? The last, you know, several months of her life, I mean, she was giddy as a child, mm. according to Benedict, uh, Benedict Groeschel, who was, um, you know, one of her uh, spiritual um, right. uh, companions. And so, uh, in any case, the, the main thing to, to, to notice is, you know, that is kind of a, a like a purgative process toward the end of one's life and it can actually happen I mean even wonderful saints like Saint Therese of Lisieux had that uh, kind of dark moment but don't get you know too too upset about it just look at it this way it, what you endure right now uh, purgatively to, to de detach you from the world what you endure right now uh, you know um, in, in terms of the pain you might be feeling mm -hmm. I'm telling you it will all end when you get right into the presence of God you just keep hanging in there but of course uh, uh, my belief is what you do now you don't pay you don't do in purgatory later mm -hmm. so I always figured you know sometimes that you you know some guys bust in your chops and you just go well well, why is this happening to me? I'm not doing anything uh, to deserve getting my chops busted. Right. But um, nevertheless, something unjust happens or something where a person just hates your guts for no apparent reason other than mm -hmm. the fact that you're a Christian or th that you actually decided to, uh, to treat them nicely. You know, they, they decide they're going to they're going to kill you. So the main thing is don't worry about it. Just look at that as down payment against purgatory later. And I just say, okay, Lord, I just offer this up to you. So my first strategy, I just say, if I can't do anything about this, if there's no, and you might be able to do something about it. I don't know. I don't know what's causing this in your life. Maybe there is something you can do about it. But if you can't do something about it, that's on that desolation checklist. Mm -hmm. Number one thing, offer it up to God for all the souls in purgatory. Offer it up to God like Mother Teresa did for all the people who were suffering and starving in India. Offer it up uh, to God, you know, as, as 
uh, you know, something for the reparation of other people's sins as well as your own, just offer it up. Number two, just trust him. You pay now. You, you know, it's against, you know, any kind of purgation that you might have to do later to detach yourself from the things of this yeah. world. I, I'm, I'm sure I'm going to have a, 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 some purgation forthcoming. I, I know that that's going to happen mm -hmm. because, of course, uh, I've got a lot of hubris left, yeah. so there's going to be some <laughs> detachment needed. And so there, um, you know, as, as that goes forward, uh, okay, but you, you can kind of oftentimes uh, pay a little bit of that up front and take, yeah. take it uh, as it is and then take it with the patience and the trust that Mother right. Teresa did, because if you do, you will wind up on the other side filled with a love that is so, so uh, unbelievable. And if you uh, write to me for the Desolation Checklist, also write to me for, um, you know, the uh, uh, near-death experience of Linda Stewart. I'll send you that, and you can see how her emotional pain, her physical pain, so simply eliminated as she moved uh, into the kingdom of heaven. Okay, so those are just some things well, you know, that you might do again. As we go to the, uh, to the book, I, uh, and since you mentioned mm -hmm. uh, Father Benedict Groeschel, and I know I mentioned once before, but I always thought it was great. Yeah. He always said he thought his purgatory was going to be spent listening over and over to his audio tapes of his lectures, that that would be his purgation, <laughs> having to listen to himself. So I, I don't think you're going to be there, but you know, maybe, maybe one or two of your oh, talks, you never know. <laughs> oh, no. Could well be, Doug, I'm telling you. I, uh, <laughs> I'm bored into tears. There was actually an Evelyn Waugh book, okay. uh, I forget the name of it now, where the guy's punishment was he had to read to this person somewhere in the jungles of, South, of, of Latin America, uh, you know, in some isolated jungle, all the classics of Dickens again and again and again and right, again. Right, right. And, of course, that was his punishment. And I forgot right. what it was now. Uh, uh, a handful of dust. They, a handful uh, of dust. That's probably anyway, where uh, yeah. Father Groeschel got it. Uh, going to your book, page yeah. 35. <laughs> Uh, we talked about render unto Caesar, what are Caesar's God, what is God. And you talk about in the chapter 6 about, the, and you've talked about this before, how we show how the church derived five major principles of social ethics from uh, the teachings of, those four teachings of Jesus that we talked about the last time. And yeah. you say that these five principles developed by Catholic clergy were the ones that were then adapted by the non-Catholic philosophers like John Locke and Thomas Jefferson, and they are, every human being has mm -hmm. intrinsic good, is transcendent, and not just law is no law at all. Every uh, being of human origin must be considered equally worthy. Every human being has the inalienable rights of life, self-government, liberty, pursuit of happiness, and property, and that's Suarez, who mm -hmm. uh, you've quoted many times. And the right to life is more fundamental than mm -hmm. the right to self-governance. Uh, and you talk about mm -hmm. how that's there, and then you lead into the fact that in 1891, Pope Leo XIII wrote the first social encyclical of the Catholic Church that attempted to set out guidelines for political, economic justice and rights within the complex economic systems, rerum novarum. So, uh, and then you yeah. say out of that, the Church developed six additional principles of social ethics. Yeah, so that's um, what really happened uh, during that period. Um, and, and like I said, this is a huge period in, in the church's history. But uh, you're right, the, the first thing is Jesus uh, sets out the fundamental principles. Those are then turned mostly by St. Augustine and St. Paul and St. Augustine. They're the two figures that really did have that sort of ability to, to lead from a personal ethic over to a more social ethic. And last time we talked about St. Augustine writing that book, De Civitate Dei, The City of God. And that book, of course, sets out really one of the most profound um, social teachings that could possibly say it's all in light of Christianity. It's all in light of those, you know, sayings, you know, whatsoever you do to the least of my brethren, you do unto me. It's all about the golden rule, which was before Jesus, there was no golden rule. There's just the silver rule. Don't do a harm to others you don't want done to you. With Jesus, it's do the good for others you want done to you. So he moves it uh, basically from a minimalistic ethic, uh, you know, don't do any unnecessary harm to uh, a, a maximalistic ethic 
ethic, which is do the good that you want done to you, to others. So the main thing then is, is you start looking at what Jesus did. Augustine formulates it within the social context. St. Paul, of course, brings the whole matter of conscience in, other so social matters in. But by the time we finish with St. Augustine, St. Augustine also has, you know, um, uh, has the, the uh, important, very important uh, philosophy that an unjust law is no law at all. So he mm -hmm. basically, again, elevates that um, that notion of uh, justice itself. That's the higher principle. The positive law, which is done by legislators or courts or something, that's not nearly as high. The, the positive law has to follow what justice is, not vice versa. Finally, it gets into the hands of St. Thomas Aquinas, who develops the natural law theory, because, of course, the natural law is for everybody. It's not just for Catholics or Christians. The natural law is for everybody. It's a matter of conscience, uh, uh, you know, uh, a senderis, as he might call it. But the main thing to, to recognize, though, is by the time it finishes with St. Um, uh, Thomas Aquinas, this Jesuit, yes, he was a Jesuit, and I'm proud to say, uh, mm -hmm. uh, Francisco Suarez. And in, uh, I think it was uh, 1620, um, Suarez writes a book called De Legibus and in the, on the laws. And in this book, uh, Suarez talks about these inalienable rights. He talks about uh, the right that exists in every human being. So every human being possesses this right, and the right obliges every other human being to treat them with minimal justice. And what is the minimum you can do in justice? Give the person, allow the person to live, we'll call it the right to life. Mm -hmm. Allow the person to govern himself if he's not doing any criminal activity. That principle of self-governance was then called the right to liberty. And then give them sufficient property so that they're not indentured servants, right? In other words, uh, okay, uh, you're free, but I own your house, I own your business, I right. own where you work, I own everything that's in your house, uh, uh, short of owning you, right? So I, I basically turned you into an indentured servant. You've got to have some private property, some property, a domicile you can call your own, and then, of course, the pursuit of happiness. Happiness is a very profound term. It's not just a feeling uh, like it is in our culture today. For the medievals and for um, for Suarez, it was much more than that. Now, mm -hmm. Suarez starts a school, uh, a school called the School of Salamanca. It's a very, very interesting school. And, of course, it comes out not only with inalienable rights, but it comes out with economic theory. Mm -hmm. and, it, and, of course, uh, uh, you know, this in Spain, uh, Spain, you know, a lot of Americans haven't even heard of the School of Salamanca. Mm -hmm. But would we have the, uh, the economic system uh, based on free market economies without the School of Salamanca? I'm not sure that we would. Would we have the inalienable rights theory that we have today without the schools? I'm not sure that we would. But because of that school, and specifically uh, Francisco Suarez and Molina and some of the other economic theory guys, what winds up happening is, of course, this goes into good old, you know, uh, Hugo Grotius. And Hugo Grotius is a very interesting, he's a Protestant, mm -hmm. but he's a Christian apologist. But of course, those who know the international law know he is the father of international law. He started off with the father of maritime law, but then he turns into the father of international law. Now, of course, Thomas Jeff um, uh, uh, John Locke was very interested in what Hugo Grotius had to say, because, of course, John Locke was interested in international law. And, of course, he saw, Locke saw this inalienable rights theory that Grotius had gotten from Suarez. And he looked at, at that and he said, this is it. Now I can prevent what he called a tyranny of the majority. Mm -hmm. So like if 51% of people, that would be a majority, say that the other 49% of people, well, they just got to die by popular vote. Let's conscript, you know, you know, let's start a law here, uh, pass a law that the other 49% have to die. Mm -hmm. And Locke would say, you can't do that uh, because, of course, that violates their inalienable rights you know, to life. And so uh, essentially that right belongs to them by their very human existence, by their very natural human existence, by their intrinsic dignity, and it belongs to them by the right and will of the creator. So that he's got this this thing set out and said, of course, no state can, t can without reason, violate the inalienable right to life. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, he sees the same thing with liberty. And this was what will intrigue Jefferson. Because what Locke saw is, you know, a state 
can't just can't go around and take away the right of self-governance of people. Uh, self-governance, you know, for, over the kind of religion they want, over the kind of domicile they'll live in. So long as they're not harming somebody else, as Locke always used to say, my right to swing my feet, fist stops where your nose begins. Mm -hmm. Okay, but so long as you're not, you know, uh, punching somebody's nose, uh, you know, uh, essentially, you should be left alone to govern yourself. Mm -hmm. You have that right and the right to pursue happiness and the right to have a certain amount of private property that you can have a, a you know, a man's a home is his castle, a person's home is a castle. So the main thing then is this gets set out in Locke's book called The Second a Treatise on Government. And this is really a seminal work. Mm -hmm. uh, Suarez sets it out uh, beautifully, but it's in this huge tome, right, on De Legibus. And, and, and of course, people kind of have a hard time sort of identifying it. I mean, people like scholars like John Finnis will see it or something like that. Mm -hmm. But the main thing is, yeah, you can basically see that this guy really um, uh, takes it seriously. And Jefferson looks at it and he's, he's looking for the rationale for a revolution, right? He's trying to say, how are we going to free ourselves from Britain when we're under the government of Britain? If the state has an all embracing right, how are we going to break free from Britain being under the state of Britain? And we can't do it. But then in the Declaration of Independence, he borrows Locke's theory, lock, stock, and barrel. Mm -hmm. And he says, we hold these truths to be self evident. In other words, it never came from a constitution, it never came from a state, it never came from a vote or a plebiscite, right? The idea then for, for, uh, for Jefferson is he says, okay, uh, we hold these truths to be so we know them in our own heart of hearts that every human being has the inalienable rights of uh, is created equal and has the inalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The minute he sets that up, these things are inviolable, inalienable. You just can't take them away without reason. Of course, the state can incarcerate you and, and take away your freedom if you're going around shooting people and so mm -hmm. forth and so on. But if you're not doing that, the state has no such right to do anything to take away your rights. The, your inalienable rights, as Suarez established, as Grotius established, as Locke established, is higher than the actual positive law. Justice and the minimum justice that's due to you, that must be accorded to you by obligation, right? Those rights right. belong to you by your very human existence and furthermore by the will of the Creator. So he says they're endowed with their create by the Creator with inalienable rights of life liberty and the pursuit of happiness. And then what does Jefferson do? He goes, and since the government of Great Britain is violating these rights, especially the right of self-governance or what he called liberty, hmm, it'll be time now for us to break our relationship and we have a due and just cause for doing this. You're violating inalienable rights. Mm -hmm. I don't have to tell you, this became, of course, a, the central document in the United States, right. but it becomes, as it were, a foundation stone for the United Nations Charter on Human Rights, uh, which is now the, the so-called United Nations Declaration mm -hmm. uh, on Human Rights. And uh, Jacques Maritain, the great Catholic uh, French philosopher, was on the com commission that actually put this uh, natural law thinking mm -hmm. in uh, to the actual charter uh, from the United right. Nations, along with many other Catholic natural law thinkers. Right. But anyway, there is the little mini history of what happened. Without Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. and without the Catholic Church, without St. Augustine, St. Mm -hmm. Thomas Quinch, above all, Francisco Suarez, there wouldn't have been right. a Grotius, a Locke, and a Jefferson, right. and the UN Charter. Well, I mean, this is like the well, legacy of, the of Catholicism. Right, I think part of the problem you've got today is you've got too many people, especially in the secular West, who by trying to bifurcate and separate Christianity don't realize they're taking away the underpinning of all of these rights that they've come to enjoy. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, uh, fundamentally, if you, if you start taking away the notion of, uh, well, not just, you know, the notion of a creator uh, who is a just God, but if you just take away the notion of justice itself, right, and then redefine inalienable rights. I mean, look at what happened. The inalienable right of abortion. Mm -hmm. Hey, wait a minute. We better go back for two minutes to Suarez, Grotius, and Locke. Uh, uh, when did inalienable rights come up? That was supposed to be the minimal justice that's due to you. In other words, these are the things you have to have in order to be and act like a human being. 
You need life to be and act like a human being. You would need self-governance to, governance to be and act like a human being. You need to be able to pursue happiness and have minimal private property so you're not an indentured servant to be and act like a human being. Uh, do you need a cell phone to be and act? Okay, then a cell phone is not an inalienable right. If you don't need it to be and act like a human being. Uh, do you need a computer uh, you know, that has you know, X, Y, Z, uh, kilobytes? And you know, and terabytes and so forth and so on. No, you don't need that to be an act like a human. Some people might think you do, but right, no, right, you really yeah. don't. And so it's not an inalienable right. And finally, of course, do you need an abortion? Uh, you know, it's like the inalienable right to slavery. Do you need to enslave people in order to be an act like a human being? Of course not. You can't produce a worse injustice in order to, you know, to guarantee your, you know, your so-called be and act like a human being. Part of being and acting like a human being can't be murdering people, which is abortion, can't be enslaving people, which is uh, slavery, etc. So you get right. the point. They can't be inalienable rights. Anytime somebody talks about the inalienable right to, to slavery or indentured servitude or abortion or right. killing the innocent, come on, you know, call it an, in, an inalienable right. right as an abomination because it simply perverts the real intention of of inalienable rights and the justice it was meant to protect in the first place. So right. you undermine the very ground of the law, no, indeed, of inalienable rights that was meant to protect human beings by including abortion. Well, if abortion is an inalienable right, then I guess you have the right to kill the innocent anytime and anywhere, so that's your right to do it. Go which, ahead. Anarchy is our next Which we know step. is absolutely wrong Sorry. and not true. <laughs> Well said, Father, as always, <laughs> yeah. if you'll give us your blessing on the way out the door, that would be great. Absolutely. And bow your heads and pray for God's blessing. And may the Lord, who truly is uh, unrestricted justice and unrestricted goodness and unrestricted love and unrestricted desire for your eternal salvation, may that Lord bless you with the wisdom of the ages, the wisdom of true politics and justice, the wisdom of the church that he uh, instituted so that you might be truly an evangelist, not only for the Christian church in Catholicism, but an evangelist for the culture and the society to bring about not only the philosophy of life, but true justice in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Very good, Father. Always great to be with you. We shall see you next week. And also don't forget that Father Spitzer's books and DVDs and videos are all available through our EWTN Village catalog on our on-demand page for free. And we'll continue more on the moral wisdom of the Catholic Church. Uh, when you rejoin us next week and this weekend, I had a wonderful interview I did with Bishop Robert J. Baker about rejoicing in our hope. Hope you enjoyed that as much as we enjoyed doing it. And we've got the Divine Liturgy for the Ordination and Enthronement of the Most Reverend Robert M. Pipta as the sixth bishop of the Eparchy of Parma. That's coming up Friday, November 17th here on EWTN at 3 p.m. Eastern Time. We hope you'll join us for that event, and we hope to see you next time when we rejoin ourselves with you in Father Spitzer's universe where something's always new. Thanks.